Hello, Reagan here. Welcome to episode 19 of Twisted States, a podcast where I take a look state by state at some of America's most nefarious killers, elusive cryptids, crispies, <laughs> cryptids and bizarre mysteries. <laughs> I know it's been a while, but I'm here now. See? See? I mean, I know it's very sporadic. I'm trying. I'm trying real hard. Um, if you want to help me do this a little more often, you can always check out my uh, links for ways to support the show. Uh, if you're over on YouTube, it'll be down in the description. If you're Buzzsprout, whatever the thing, it's there. Uh, Patreon, uh, Disruptive Girl. That's my umbrella main thing that I do all my stuff under. Um... Yeah, anyway, check that out. Check stuff out. There, Like I said, there are means by which to help support this show so that I can bring you more episodes more often. And, uh, but yeah, either way, I'll squeak one out here and there, even if you don't. But just simply listening is supporting. So I appreciate that. And thank you for your time. Anyway, this week, this month, this year, this time, this episode, <laughs> we are going to Oklahoma. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, here we go. <sighs> this one, this was a heavy one. This one was a little rough to research. Like, wow. Ah, it's terrible. Yikes. Um, anyway. So Oklahoma, little history on the state here. Oklahoma was the 46th state to join the union. And that occurred on November 16th of 1907. Um, Oklahoma is kind of South central. It's like just above Texas. Um, yeah, it's got Texas to the south and somewhat of the west of it. Uh, Kansas in the north, Missouri in the northeast, Arkansas in the east, New Mexico in the west, and Colorado to the northwest. The state capital of Oklahoma is Oklahoma City. And uh, currently has the state has roughly a population of about 4 million people. So, um, Oklahoma, up until right before statehood, was pretty much just Native American territory. They used Oklahoma to, like, relocate a lot of natives from a lot of the indigenous people that were located to the east of the Mississippi. They shoved them over into Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So the state's name is derived from the Choctaw words Okla and Hama, which translates uh, 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 people red. So red people. Um, and uh, it's nicknamed the Sooner State. I did not know this in reference to the settlers who staked their claims on land before the official opening date of lands in the Western Oklahoma Territory on or before the Indian Appropriations Act of 1889, which increased European American settlement in the Eastern Indian Territory. Uh, so, yeah, the Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory were merged into the state of Oklahoma when it became a state in 1907. Um, it's a very rich, lush area with a lot going on. They have some very extreme weather in Oklahoma. Lots of tornadoes. <laughs> Lots of tornadoes. But Oklahoma is also a major producer of natural gas, oil, a lot of agricultural stuff going on there. They rely on an economic base of aviation, energy, telecommunications, and biotechnology. Um, Oklahoma City and Tulsa are like the two main like hubs and where the majority of the population of the state lives, pretty much in those general um, areas. Um, the name Oklahoma uh, was the suggested name by Choctaw Nation Chief Alan Wright in 1866 during the treaty negotiations with the federal government on the use of Indian Territory. He envisioned an all-American Indian state controlled by the United States Superintendent of Indian Affairs. So the indigenous peoples um, were present in what is now Oklahoma by the last ice age. Ancestors of several of the current tribes in the area um, lived in the central 
uh, it lived in what is now Oklahoma and the central and west of the state. And then there was a subgroup, the Panhandle culture people living in the Panhandle region. Uh, Catawba, Mississippi and culture peoples lived in the eastern part of the state. Um, Spiro's now, Spiro Mounds, Spiro Mounds. And what is now Spiro, Oklahoma, was a major Mississippian mound complex that flourished between 8850 and 1450. Plains Apache people settled in the southern plains and in Oklahoma between 1300 and 1500. The expedition of Spaniard Francisco Vasquez de Coronado traveled through the state in 1541, but French explorers claimed the area in the early 18th century. By the 18th century, Comanche and uh, Kiowa entered the region from the west, and Quapaw and Osage peoples moved into what is now eastern Oklahoma. French colonists claimed the region until 1803, when all the French territory west of the Mississippi River was acquired by the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. The territory was part of the Arkansas Territory from 1819 until 1828. During the 19th century, the U.S. federal government forcibly removed tens of thousands of Native Americans from their homelands from across North America and transported them to the area including and surrounding present-day Oklahoma. The Choctaw was the first of the five civilized tribes to be removed from the southeastern United States. The phrase Trail of Tears originated from a description of the removal of the Choctaw Nation in 1831, although the term is usually used for the Cherokee removal. 17,000 Cherokees and 2,000 other black slaves were deported. The area already occupied by Osage and Quapaw tribes was called the Choctaw Nation until revised Native American and the later American policy redefined the boundaries to include other Native Americans. By 1890, more than 30 Native American nations and tribes had been concentrated on land within Indian territory or Indian country. All five civilized tribes supported and signed treaties with the Confederate military during the American Civil War. The Cherokee Nation had an internal civil war. Slavery in Indian Territory was not abolished until 1866. In the period between 1866 and 1899, cattle ranches in Texas strove to meet the demands for food in eastern cities, and railroads in Kansas promised to deliver in a timely manner. Cattle trails and cattle ranches developed as cowboys either drove their product north or settled illegally in Indian Territory. In 1881, four of five major cattle trails in the western frontier traveled through Indian Territory. Increased presence of white settlers in Indian Territory prompted the United States government to establish the Dawes Act in 1887, which divided the lands of individual tribes into allotments for individual families, encouraging farming and private land ownership among Native Americans, but expropriating land to the federal government in the process. Railroad companies took near, nearly half of the Indian-held land within the territory from outside settlers and for purchase. Major land runs, including the land run of 1889, were held for settlers, where certain territories were open to settlement starting at a precise time. Usually land was open to settlers on first-come, first-served basis. Those who broke the rules by crossing the border of the territory before the official opening time were said to have been crossing the border sooner, leading to the term Sooners, which eventually became the state's official nickname. Deliberations to make the territory into a state began near the end of the 19th century when the Curtis Act continued the allotment of Indian tribal land. So, yeah, they... Uh, <laughs> it goes on. It was a mess. Like, I... God, we just... I don't even... Attempts to create an all-Indian state named Oklahoma and later attempt to create an all-Indian state named Sequoia failed, but the Sequoia Statehood Convention of 1905 eventually laid the groundwork for the Oklahoma Statehood Convention, which took place two years later. On June 16, 1906, Congress enacted a statute authorizing the people of the Oklahoma and Indian Territories, as well as what would become the states of Arizona and New Mexico, to form a constitution and state government in order to be admitted as a state. On November 16, 1907, President Theodore Roosevelt issued Presidential Proclamation No. 780, establishing Oklahoma as the 46th state in the Union. Um, so this ties into the story, so I'm continuing to read. I, this is from Wikipedia, of course, just reading about the state of Oklahoma. But keeping going here because this is really going to cover a lot of stuff that's related. 
The new state became a focal point for the emerging oil industry, as discoveries of oil pools prompted towns to grow rapidly in population and wealth. Tulsa eventually became known as the oil capital of the world for most of the 20th century, and oil investments fueled much of the state's early economy. In 1927, Oklahoman businessman Cyrus Avery, known as the father of Route 66, began the campaign to create U.S. Route 66 using a stretch of highway from Amarillo, Texas to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to form the original portion of the Highway 66. Avery spearheaded the creation of the U.S. Highway 66 Association to oversee the planning of Route 66 based on his hometown of Tulsa. So it goes on and on and on and on and on. Let's go ahead and get into what we want to talk about. So um, William Hale is the reason why we are in Oklahoma today talking about the state of Oklahoma. Uh, So as mentioned, oil was discovered in Oklahoma Oil was discovered in 1897 on the Osage Indian Reservation. As wonderful as it was, especially during this early era of industrialization, to find the oil there, it was very relevant to growth and, you know, meant a lot to the state and it was a very important commodity and a big deal, a big deal, okay? Um, the the downfall of that is there's, you know, anytime there's that kind of money, there's always going to be greed and someone trying to capitalize on, you know, the situation, take advantage, take more than their share, be a piece of crap, right? So... Unfortunately, due to the nature of the way the oil rights were set up for the Osage people, anybody could basically claim their money. Um, Like uh, a a couple gets married, the spouse passes away. Guess what? (laughs) Ta-da! You know, uh, their spouse, regardless of their... A heritage now inherits those oil rights. Um, this led to several cases of severe exploitation of this this policy, um, with like roughly sixty plus deaths being tied back to people trying to exploit this and get their hands on some some money from these these people that have been through these indigenous people that have been through absolute you know hell um one of the families (laughs) that unfortunately had to endure this whole situation um i i don't even know how to like (laughs) okay so lizzie q okay um had some children (laughs) she has some some daughters and a son Uh, her daughter Anna Brown was discovered in May of 1921 severely decomposed and uh, in a a remote ravine and had a, uh, a bullet wound to the back of her head she had been shot um the following year Anna's sister Minnie died from what they called quick consumption uh, in 1922. Uh, Lizzie Q herself, her, the mother of Anna and, and Minnie, died suspiciously in July of 1921. Um, another family member, um, a cousin, uh, Henry Rowan, was shot in 1923 brother and sister-in-law of Minnie died in a house bombing in March of 1923. This family lost over a dozen family members. All with these crazy wild deaths. Nobody was getting getting blamed. No investigations were happening. Like, everybody was just 
looking the other way. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was not doing their job. These these deaths were not being investigated. Um, once again, they're, you know, these people that had married into this family were capitalizing on this. The, the family line was dwindling. And all this money was funneling down to people that, that, that were actually behind all of these horrible horrible deaths. Eventually, um, the tribal council realizing that they were in over their head and that the, the, the investigations that were being done weren't turning up any answers, finally reached out to the federal government. And this was when the FBI was still in its infancy. Okay. But they did manage to come to, you know, terms with the fact that there was definitely a problem here. And this is something that needed to be investigated. Almost immediately, like anybody with eyes could see that William Hale was their top suspect. He was the so-called king of the Osage Hills. He was a local cattleman. He had bribed, intimidated, lied, and stolen his way to wealth and power. And he continued to be this greedy piece of crap. Did everything he possibly could to gain as much access to these head rights and the royalties coming from the oil as he possibly could. So his nephew, Ernest Burkhart, was married to Anna's sister, And if Anna, her mother, and two sisters passed away in that order, all of the head rights would pass to the nephew. And then, of course, that would give William Hale a chance to take control. At the time, they were bringing in roughly half a million dollars a year or more. So when the FBI showed up, here's these outsiders. They come in. They have no, you know... um, (laughs) at that time, especially with everything else going on, um, you know, these natives really didn't have much faith, hope, or um, willingness to cooperate with the federal government. I mean, these are the same people that have, you know, taken so much land from them and delegated them to, you know, these areas that, that they considered, like, basically undesirable or whatever, you know. Just so much was so bad, and it was so hard for them to actually, you know, gain the trust of the locals. And Hale, of course, he took that um, to his advantage and was going out of his way to um, put out false, uh, you know, leads and get the scent off, uh, you know, uh, get get the scent off his trail. He didn't want them, you know, looking into him. So he was, you know, pointing fingers other places and trying to get, trying to get eyes off of him. So finally, in a last-ditch effort to try to corner Hale and uh, get to the bottom of everything that was going on, four FBI agents went there undercover. One as an insurance salesman, another as someone purchasing cattle, another as an oil prospector, and uh, yet another one as an herbal doctor. Um, to try to infiltrate the community so that they could come up with some kind of evidence. And it took time. It took a lot of time and a lot of effort. And they finally, um, you know, it took... The Anna Brown died in May of 1921. It took until January of 1929 to finally convict Hale. They finally were able to build a case and the way that they finally got to it they actually uh, pressured and cornered uh, the nephew finally talked and uh, once he once he opened up and started spilling his guts everybody else kind of started confessing uh, they were able to prove the agents were able to prove that Hale ordered the murders of Anna and her family in order to inherit their oil rights 
cousin Rowan for the insurance and others who had threatened to expose him for what he was doing. So in January 1929, Hale was convicted and sent to prison uh, along with some of his, you know, cohorts, including a hired killer and uh, the dirty lawyer that was trying to help him get off on all of this stuff. So, yeah, um, due to what happened here and what Hale did, they were um, able to change the laws uh, as far as head rights went so that in order to inherit oil rights from someone, you had to actually be uh, an heir, a bloodline heir, not just married to the person. Um, just you had to be of uh, Native American descent and uh, of the Osage tribe in order to get right. <sighs> but yeah, I mean, all total, the family lost over a dozen members. Um, overall, big picture wise, there were 60 plus deaths between 1918 and 1931 all surrounding people just trying to exploit these people for their oil right money. That's insane. Anyway, so um, there you have it. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Ridiculous. Not surprising, unfortunately. Uh, greed is, is ridiculous. It's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. But, I mean, at least they did eventually catch him, but it's just a shame that so many innocent lives were lost. Just, just over greed. Just money, 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 money. That's it. Well, thank you for uh, hanging in there. And uh, I will not let it be so long <laughs> until my next episode. I'm looking at like monthly episodes uh, for the time being, but I at least wanted to get something out as soon as I could. And uh, this was unfortunately as soon as I was able to, that we will get re back to a regular upload schedule. And um, if you check out my Patreon, I'll be sharing some stuff over there. And also I have a mailing list and stuff and I send out mail for anyone um, that contributes three dollars or more you will get monthly mail from me if you include a mailing address and uh yeah so uh, i also have some traveling and stuff planned if the weather will ever get to the point where i can um i did uh recently uh, uh before before the weather turned so crappy in the fall uh, my youngest son and i took a trip out to the lost dutchman and we also stopped off at the Vulture Mine, which was really awesome. And I plan to go back out there because I do uh, have some plans to do some miniature buildings and stuff associated with the Vulture Mine. And possibly some stuff associated with Lost Dutchman as well. We'll see. But uh, yeah, uh, stick around. Do all that fun stuff. Uh, check out my social, my links and all that fun stuff. And I will see you next episode. Bye.